Hello, welcome to my historically inspired wardrobe series. It's actually part two to another video that I made where I make a very late Edwardian sort of precursor to the armistice blouse, which would have been worn in the early to mid 19 teens. My initial inspiration was loosely based on an outfit that we see Lady Mary wear in season two of Downton Abbey. And I'm left with kind of a dilemma. It's the same dilemma that I have whenever I'm inspired by something from historical entertainment. Whoever the costume designer was is hopefully taking their inspiration from history. When I'm inspired by their work, I'm being inspired by an interpretation, not a primary source, such as an extant garment. So what I'm going to end up with is an interpretation of an interpretation of a time in fashion history. So this is the balance that I've struck over many years of being faced with this dilemma. I go ahead and let myself be inspired by the TV show, movie, or work of art, and then I go back to primary sources of that time, and I let this new inspiration guide my version of historical garments. The outfit that I'm making now is very much inspired by this particular outfit in Downton Abbey, as well as coming to the realization that this late Edwardian pre-World War I era clothing was moving from vintage to antique, and I wanted to celebrate that. I like this time period in fashion because I think it's the earliest modern clothing. This is the transitional period between identifiably archaic Edwardian gowns and moving into what wouldn't necessarily be very eye-catchingly archaic if we wore it into the supermarket today. This was also a transitional time in fashion in its own right because we're moving from the long, loose, drapey look of the Edwardian era which very quickly had to become more practical as we move through World War I. So this early 19-teens time, we still see a lot of the very feminine fabrics and lace and softness of the Edwardians, coupled with the shorter hemlines and no trains, in day wear at least, making it more functional. So here's what I did. This is a pattern that I found. It's a reprint from the Ladies' Home Journal by Past Patterns. There aren't a lot of detailed instructions, so you're kind of left with the pattern pieces, where they go, and how you get there is up to you. Which isn't bad, it's just not maybe necessarily for the beginner. But I really like the skirt with the, uh, with the layers on it. It isn't often that I'll take a pattern and just make it straight without using, you know, pieces from this pattern and pieces from that pattern and kind of making my own image out of it. But I actually really like this skirt. I like the three different layers on it. I like the belt that hangs down. I like the more structured geometric top part with the flowing two layers of skirt. So I actually don't anticipate changing it very much. The fabric I chose to make it from, again, is a deviation from the movie where it looks like she has kind of a silk satin, mossy gray green fabric. And instead, I'm going to go with a slightly more vibrant shade of teal in a linen cotton blend that I just happen to have yards of sitting around. Again, definitely an argument for keeping a well-stocked stash. I don't have to load up my three kids and run to the fabric store when I want to start making a garment, which is a huge plus. So this particular pattern doesn't have grain lines on it, but when you're cutting things out, generally there's going to be a slight stretch one direction and not the other. You want that, that direction that it stretches a little bit to be going around the body and the direction where it doesn't stretch at all, you want that to be going up and down the length of the body so that it doesn't stretch down over time. So let's get started. I will grab my trusty pattern weights and meet you on the floor to cut out the actual pieces. Just as a technique note, if there is no specific layout of a pattern, then either pin your entire pattern down to your fabric so that you know where everything is before you start cutting it, or start cutting with the biggest, most prominent pieces first. That way, if I get to the end and I realize that I'm a little short or I have to kind of move things around a little bit, it's a lot easier to take a smaller piece and move it around on a leftover piece of remnant than it is to go, oh great, now I have to put a big triangle wedge in the front of my skirt. So here we go. I have all of my pieces cut out and we're all set. 
Okay, so I'm gonna put Taylor's tacks in. Um, if you're not familiar with Taylor tacks, they're, they're pretty helpful. Basically just take a needle and thread and you sew through the pattern and your fabrics. Clip it off, separate them ever so slightly and then clip it again. And then you have pieces of thread exactly where that mark on the pattern is and exactly in relation to each other. Sometimes if you take them and trace them with a pencil or something, you can get them off a little bit, but this is a very precise way to mark your fabric non-permanently. You will have little pieces of thread everywhere, but you won't have to worry about chalk or pencil or anything that may or may not come out later. And with that, we'll start sewing things together. Another thing that I'm gonna change is that I'm gonna make the opening go in the back instead of in the front. I want the front to be as clean and not gapey as possible. So I'm gonna start about eight inches from the edge of the piece to give myself a little room to open in the back. I am leaving this unlined because I want it to be as light as possible. So I'm just trimming down one side of the seam allowance to about half of the other. I'm just gonna roll it over, give it a quick press with my finger, and then use the edge of the presser foot as my guide and make a nice top stitch running down the length of the skirt seam. So the next thing I'm gonna to put together is the belt with these kind of hanging down parts. I thought that they were loose, but it looks like they're actually top stitched down. I think once you get to this part that hangs down on the overskirt, that part is loose as well. So I'm gonna grab this front piece, and again, it looks like from the original skirt, this part is supposed to be open and overlap the other side of the waist, but I'm gonna sew them all together because I want the opening to be in the back to keep the lines as clean and straight and crisp as possible. So I'm just sewing these inside out. Then I'm gonna top stitch it all down so it's very flat. On hindsight, I probably could have just ironed it and left it because when I'm assembling all the pieces later, I'm gonna have to go over it again. So if I ever make this again, I'll probably leave this section of top stitching out and just press it flat. Then I'm just going through the exact same motions for the other part of the overlap in the front. Moving on to the belt. So because I want the points to close a little closer together in the front, the pattern piece ended up actually being a little too short. So I did piece together a little bit to go in the back. But as we all know, piecing is period. So that's totally fine. But I'm gonna try and get those seams on the inside of the waist instead of the outside. I'm just gonna line it up and then go through the same steps that I did for the overlap in the front where I'll sew around the whole piece Clip the corners to avoid bulk, turn it inside out, and top stitch around the whole thing. Next, I'm sewing together the overskirt, again leaving about an eight inch gap to close at the waist.
and I've decided to turn under and hem the opening and leave the overskirt and the main body of the skirt separate. I suppose you could hem them together, but I think this way will flow a lot better if they're two separate pieces. So I'm just gonna turn this under and hem it down and then turn that hem into a top stitch for the seam that runs straight down the back. Again, trying to keep any kind of gathering or puckering or gaping at a minimum and trying to keep these lines very clean and very straight. So I'm gonna leave hemming the actual bottom of the skirt pieces for last so that I can try it on and make sure that I like how long it is. But I am going to hem the front points that go down. Okay, so I've got my overskirt hemmed up the front and sewn together. I have the main body of my skirt with all of its seams sewn and felled. So we'll just find all of our tailor's tacks, line them up with the corresponding tacks on the overskirt, and then pin it all together. Now that everything's pinned in place, I'm just going to sew the overskirt to the main body skirt. At this point, I took some care to make sure that everything was going to align, everything was on the right angle. I decided to sew things down as I went, so I knew that this point was aligned correctly. I'm going to sew it down so that there's no chance of it shifting or moving or having to sew something invisibly later. So now just double, triple checking that everything is lining up correctly. I've got three and a half inches on this side and three and a half inches on this side. And then pin it down quickly before anything moves. All right, looks good. We're ready to sew it down. And now, having tried the skirt on, I find that I don't actually really want to make any adjustments to it, so I'm going to leave it the length that it is and start hemming the top skirt and the main body of the skirt. One of the last housekeeping steps is what to do with this open edge along the inside. Because the waistband belt is two layers, I'm just going to grab the inside layer and sew it down to it and it'll be invisible from the outside. 
And there we have it. It's lovely. All the points look like they line up correctly. All the lines look straight. I think that I'm actually not going to end up slashing it for the pocket because I do want this to be nice and flat. But yeah, it looks like we're done. Well, thank you for joining me on this little journey back to the early 20th century. I hope you had as much fun as I did. And we will see you again next time. Bye. This is my story. It was about to rain, and um, um, white alligators were coming out, and it was a fire light alligator when it had lightning. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, but it was this fire, and it had buttons, and that was all. When the rain stopped, there was still water, and it could become a river to lots of fishes. To lots of fishes? Yeah, because look at. There's alligators. Yeah. Light alligators. Yeah, that's a good river. I captured an octopus, a colossal squid. It's got a bow and arrows on its tentacles. And this one... Does it have bow and arrows or does it have barbs? It has bow and arrows because look at it. Wow. And I didn't know the squid have bows and arrows on their tentacles. And this is um an octopus um uh, airplane because look at it. It has a little airplane of... Um, uh, um, um, the pillars on it, on oh, his tentacles. That's a pretty good fishing trip. And this one is a Viking octopus. Cause look at it's a Viking octopus. Yeah, cause look at it. it's got nice. a thing. <laughs> and look at this one is a queen um um octopus. Cause look at it's got wings. It's a a butterfly octopus. Cause um it's a butterfly it's a butterfly octopus. Cause look at it's got wings and things. Okay. And the dinosaurs and raptors were heading, because look at And some raptors were not belonging to um, uh, dinosaurs of T-Rexes, and that's why they were fighting, and Queens uh, didn't like dinosaurs, and that's why she ran away in the house. Mm. That's and, why Snow White ran away from the T-Rex? Yeah. Uh-huh, and, and, um, 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 so I was getting some toys, and, I got back just in time, and I had another raptor and a spinosaurus. And uh, the spinosaurus and the raptor were still fighting, but this was not a raptor now. It was a colossal uh, dinosaur. I mean, um, a conoraptor octopus squid. Wow. That's... What was it? <laughs> Conor dinosaur, no, a conor raptor, a conor, conor raptor octopus squid. Uh, and the raptors um, sometimes roar when they win dinosaurs. Oh, okay. And some dinosaurs fight when they win because they want to win again to get a piston cup, but a, bra a rock because <laughs> dinosaurs can't pick up piston cups. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because that's... There's just so many movie references right now. And, okay, so we have Blue from Jurassic Park. Uh -huh, and, and we have Snow White being a queen. Uh, but, and they're but, fighting over the piston cup from cars. No, but look, look, look. Who um, wants the piston cup from cars? Um, 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 only the raptor wants a piston cup, but oh. he doesn't get a piston cup. He gets a rock because dinosaurs can't pick up piston cups. Well, I don't know. He might. He can open a door. Yes. But they can't pick up kissing cups. Oh, okay. But look at and some bunnies are afraid of um veggie dinosaurs. Ah. Uh -huh. Aha, some rabbits.